So, picture this. I'm working on a script, digging into some data, and then stumble upon the analytical research titled Ukraine, Russia, and European Security. Intriguing, right? Well, the gist is clear and totally understandable, but then the report's date hits me. February 1994. I'm like, wait a minute, what? Were they predicting the biggest European military conflict 30 years ago? Why analyze Ukraine-Russia relations back then? The report is said to be focusing upon Russia's ambivalence regarding the legitimacy of Ukrainian sovereignty and Ukraine's search for national identity. The slight chill down my spine goes on as it even explores Russia's claims on Ukraine's territory, especially on Crimea and the Russian-speaking minority in Ukraine. Check the author, Peter Van Ham, the European security researcher, devoted his entire life to security issues. There's some other mind-blowing works too. In 2001, he shared the idea that thanks to the media revolution, you gotta kick off a PR campaign before any military campaign. Saddam Hussein or Slobodan Milosevic should be first turned into little Hitlers before the international community can take some countermeasures. Fast forward to 2014, the West imposed sanctions against Russia. Not so impressive sanctions compared to today's ones. Even then, Van Ham warned, Sanctions encouraged Russia's pivot to China, probably strengthened public support for Putin, and harmed the EU's image among ordinary people, as sanctions, being a form of collective punishment, hit them in the first place. Peter Van Ham's work seemed reasonable and somehow prophetic. And I want to now dive into the post-USSR-Russia-Ukraine relationship, so you'll get a chance to shed some light on the context of what is really happening today. Let's first remind ourselves of what the USSR was like. Back in the early 20th century, the Russian Empire, like most big states at the time, included national republics. In 1917, the Russian Empire saw a revolution followed by a civil war. As a result, a bunch of Soviet republics popped up on the former Russian Empire lands, divided along ethnic lines. Formerly sovereign and union states, the Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusian, and Transcaucasian Social Federative Soviet Republics signed a deal that tied them together into one big state. Just a heads up, we'll revisit this later. In the following decades, the Soviet republics changed some of their structures but remained regions within one Soviet state, with Moscow pulling all the strings. So the collapse of the Soviet Union turned everything upside down. The once united states split into many independent ones. Moscow used to call the shots, opposed to Western capitalists, and build communism for a bright future. Then the reforms hit, not the liberalization type, but a full makeover, where completely new deals were to be signed. In simpler terms, yesterday's territories became independent states, and folks had to wrap their heads around it and figure out a new strategy. After all, they were locked in together for 70 years, thinking the red communist path was the right way to go. Recognizing changes in the world's view ain't that simple. Think about it. How many times have you and your ex tried to pull the same moves you did in the past? And to make things more complicated, Russian people were still hanging out in many ex-Soviet republics with some military bases and, worst of all, nuclear weapons. Throw in some politicians bragging about restoring the Soviet Union up to its former glory. The dissolution of the Soviet Empire has been a painful and complicated process. Many Russians have found it difficult to come to terms with the fact that Russia's internal empire has now been dissolved. Now let's talk about Ukraine, a pretty significant X in this scenario. 
It is the third republic in terms of territory, second in population and economic importance. It used to be a big deal, accounting for 25% of the Soviet GNP and 21% of the agricultural sector. Weapons were strategically placed on the western borders of the Soviet Union, which is now independent Ukraine. Moscow sent people and a fleet there to guard the borders within the Union, but after the collapse, everyone ended up sealed in another state. Meanwhile, Russia and Ukraine are also closely linked culturally and ethnically. Russians in Moscow or St. Petersburg feel that they have much more in common with Ukrainians than with their countrymen in Yakuts or Vladivostok. Geographical location matters enormously. The sense of kinship is enhanced by the fact that about 22% of Ukraine's population is ethnically Russian. But at that time, there were folks in the Russian government who had trouble accepting Ukraine's newfound sovereignty. On March the 17th, 1993, the Financial Times published an article amidst other news that would definitely take a front page today. It went like this. Senior Russian officials have cautioned East European countries not to form closer political and military ties with Ukraine. A campaign has been launched to bring Ukraine back under Russian hegemony. This month, Mr. Yeltsin called on the United Nations to give Russia special authority to police disputes in the former Soviet Union, eliciting protests from independent-minded republics such as Ukraine and Moldova. Mr. Sergei Stankiewicz, a political advisor to Mr. Yeltsin, recently warned Poland to limit growing political and military ties with Ukraine. Speaking in Warsaw last month, Mr. Stankiewicz said Ukraine and Belarus fell within Russia's sphere of influence. And if you're wondering why the Russian elites paid special attention to the Poles, here's a tip. Poland was the first to recognize Ukraine's independence. On December 1, 1991, Ukraine chose independence in a referendum. And on December 3rd, Lech Wałęsa shot a telegram to Ukraine congratulating them and promising future diplomatic relations. Russian officials were warning East European countries not to bother building large embassies in Kiev because within 18 months they will be downgraded to consular sections. The message was crystal clear, you know. At the same time, Leonid Smolyakov, the first Russian ambassador to Ukraine, called Ukraine's independence a transitional phenomenon. If you haven't lost your marbles thinking about this in today's context, here's a little follow-up on Crimea. If the people of Crimea express a desire for self-determination, Russia would support their choice. Even back then, Ukrainian reps were drawing parallels between Russia and Germany of 1939, hinting at the same danger of appeasement concessions with Russia and the former Soviet republics. We don't vibe with those analogies, but try to stay real instead. It's wild how some tiny column in a news magazine turns out to be prophetic. Every paragraph talks about the growing conflict between Russia, Ukraine, and the West, and even Crimea comes as a hot topic. Now, Dmitry Medvedev, Russia's ex-president, is calling Ukraine a 404 state, basically saying it's not real. And his texts are full of hate for Poland, the first country to recognize Ukraine's independence. It's the breakup narrative. You don't just watch your ex move on without some snarky comments. Medvedev's around 30 at that time, soaking up an ideology that sees the Soviet Union's collapse as a tragic mistake. And it wasn't just Medvedev, others were singing the same tune. We will analyze why the Soviet Union was Let's analyze it. Республики, национальной республики, самоопределение наций, заложенные фактически изначально при построении государства, ошибки привели к распаду страны. Страна распалась из-за этого, люди пострадали. Мы сейчас с вами выводы должны делать из этого. 
One of the essential ideological pillars of the Russian government is right here. Excessive autonomy plus federalism equals a threat to the country's stability. Does this sound too familiar to today's scenario? The echoes of this ideology have persisted since the USSR's collapse. In 1991, the deputy mayor of St. Petersburg repeated the same idea. Мне бы хотелось два слова сказать о той трагедии, которую мы переживаем сегодня, а именно трагедии распада нашего государства. А иначе как трагедия это не назовешь. Я думаю, что как раз деятели октября 17 года заложили мину замедленного действия под это здание, под здание унитарного государства, которое называлось Россией. И что они сделали? Они разбили наше отечество на отдельные княжества, которые раньше на карте земного шара и не фигурировали вообще, наделили эти княжества правительствами и парламентами, так? а теперь мы имеем то, что имеем. Отдельные княжества, которые раньше на карте земного шара и не фигурировали вообще. And here's the kicker. Even back then, the question of the Crimean region belonging to the Ukrainian principality was already on the table. After the USSR's collapse, things got pretty awkward. Back in the Hammer and Sickle era, the Black Sea Fleet, with all its ships, submarines and aircraft, were placed in Sevastopol. But then BAM! The republics crumbled and the Russian Black Sea Fleet found itself stuck in another country. Remember, the unified state of the USSR was formed by sovereign and union republics, while well, the situation around Crimea gets messier as the USSR, redrawing the inner map, shifted Crimea from the Russian Soviet Republic to the Ukrainian Soviet Republic in 1954 for economic and administrative reasons. This became another argument for conservative forces in Russia to roll back the territory division. On the flip side, the peninsula has been part of Ukraine for almost four decades, and their troops were present there. And Ukraine is kind of like the Soviets' heir, just like the other republics. Yet the Black Sea Fleet belonged to Russia. And judging by the 1989 census, most of Crimea's population were ethnic Russians. What to do with all this info? No surprise, right after the Soviet Union crumbled in 91, the question of whose Crimea is it arose. Just a couple of weeks after the Union's collapse, Kravchuk and Yeltsin clashed over the question of the fleet's ownership. So there grows confrontation. Yeltsin is all about shipping the fleet back to the Russian harbour, and Kravchuk decided to shelve the fleet talk for another six months, but tells a different story to his Kiev officers. Politics, you know, gotta play all sides. Russia and Ukraine wrestle over the fleet for ages, trying to split it up. There's even a decree war, with each side claiming the fleet as their own. This mess reaches the UN. In a surprising move, in July 93, the Russian Federation's Supreme Council drops a resolution concerning the question of whose land is Sevastopol. The now defunct Russian body declares Sevastopol as Russian territory. It was an attempt to redraw boundaries with a pen stroke. And this is how Ruslan Kazbolatov, the Supreme Council chairman, commented on this decision. Unfortunately, a very bad situation was created, including the issue with our Black Sea fleet. The new Ukrainian authorities didn't let our base function normally. A powerful fleet needs serious infrastructure, apartments, bases, plants, factories with thousands of people working for it. They caused all sorts of interference. The Black Sea Fleet commander comes to Moscow, tries to meet with the defense minister and gets the cold shoulder. Tries to meet with the president, same, he is not accepted. They come and tell me that the commander waits in the reception room, almost in tears. I heard him out got outraged, invited reporters, spoke in front of the cameras and said we'd never let anyone disrespect manipulate the Black Sea fleet, and we started preparing the document on Sevastopol. 
Chaos ensues. Ukraine responds to this resolution by seeking a UN Security Council arbitrator. At first, the Ukrainian Foreign Ministry calls this a blatant violation of Ukrainian law and an encroachment on Ukraine's territorial integrity. The President of Ukraine chimes in, saying anti-Ukrainian politics are revving up and Ukrainian-Russian relations are escalating. And as you remember, Sevastopol doesn't join Russia in 1993. Back then, Russia decides not to send troops. Quick sidebar, when we say Russia decided, Ukraine decided, the West decided, we're oversimplifying, omitting the specific forces fighting against one another. And there's always political disputes and confrontation in every country. In stable times, it's under the radar for an average person. But after the union collapse, political rivalry hit a whole new level. For example, in 93, Russia had a political clash between the president and the Supreme Council of the Russian Federation, as mentioned earlier. As a result, the president came out on top and the Supreme Council was dissolved. Sevastopol didn't join Russia in 93 because the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs quickly disowned the Supreme Council's decision, saying it didn't align with the president's vision and was more of an emotional, declarative action, complicating the search for real solutions. And that Russia planned to sort things out through political talks and agreements with Ukraine. The dispute over the Black Sea Fleet only got settled a few years later, in 99. But one more thing kept the Russian elites of that time up at night. Nuclear weapons. The Soviet Union strategically places nuclear weapons along its borders, including the BSSR, USSR, and KSSR. At the end of 1991, these Soviet territories transformed into independent states, carrying the baggage of Soviet nuclear weapons. And it wasn't just Russia's headache. It rattled the entire world. The deal is that six months before the Soviet collapse, the USA and USSR inked START-1, a nuclear weapons reduction treaty. Six months later, the USSR dissolves, leaving questions dangling. What to do with the nukes? How to bring them back? And what about START-1 that has a specific clause which forbids deploying strategic weapons outside national territory? There's no more Soviets. Russia's now the legal successor, keeping all the previous agreements valid. Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan are still figuring out their status. And Russian weapons, as it turns out, are now deployed, breaking the START-1 treaty. Another round of renegotiations kicks off. Moscow wasn't the only one keen on reclaiming nuclear might. Washington would prefer that too, as dealing with just one nuclear power is way easier than negotiating with Kazakhstan, Ukraine and Belarus all at once. More nuclear states means a bigger threat to the world. There was a disarmament wave, then bam, overnight, three more nuclear states emerged. Here's the pivotal part. Only Kazakhstan and Belarus swiftly struck a deal. Ukraine, on the other hand, started pondering how to milk the nuclear cow for maximum benefits, which resulted in political bargaining. We cannot guarantee that weapons transported to Russia will be destroyed or that they will not fall into undesirable hands. We want guarantees that they can't be used elsewhere. I don't want to make anybody else stronger. But without Russia's infrastructure, Ukraine couldn't maintain, let alone use, its nuclear arsenal. This is pointed out by both the work's author, Peter Van Ham, and the former president of Ukraine in 2015. I couldn't control nuclear weapons. In 1997, the lifespan of the warheads was expiring. That is, according to the laws of physics, the warheads needed to be replaced. 165 nuclear missiles. Each missile was not just one warhead. We did not produce warheads. All of them were made in Russia, near Nizhny Novgorod. 
And if we hadn't handed over those warheads, and by 1997, no one would have accepted them from us, they would have become unsafe. Dismantling an expired warhead is not like reloading a pistol. To establish the production of warheads in Ukraine, scientists mentioned a figure of $80 billion. We had nothing in our accounts. Would anyone have given us loans to produce warheads? That would be madness. When some say, if we had been armed with nuclear warheads, we would have been stronger and taken more seriously, they are right. But if these warheads were made in Ukraine, the control would be Ukrainian, so that I, or whoever came after me, would have the nuclear briefcase and the ability to control the system. However, none of this was the case. What we had was foreign nuclear weapons on our territory, and the only options were to completely replace them or surrender them. Since we couldn't replace them, plus there was international pressure, because every single warhead was targeted at the USA, therefore the root of the issue is not that we were so foolish to just give up nuclear weapons, we couldn't control them. In 1992, Ukraine went from idealistic non-proliferation of nuclear weapons to pragmatic demands for economic and political payoffs from both Russia and the West. Well, let's once again break down everyone's wish list. Ukraine saw itself as the rightful heir to nuclear weapons. So, if you want them gone, cough up some cash. Plus, they could use some deterrence factors, fearing that Russia might get nostalgic about the Soviet glory and, God forbid, use military force. And all this while ideas of Ukrainian national identity were on the upswing. Meanwhile, Russia wanted to stay the guardian of post-Soviet countries, so they had to return the scattered weapons to regain control of the colossal arsenal and to show the world that the Soviet Union's collapse didn't shake Russian leadership. Washington, aiming for the global guardian role, wanted to minimize the nuclear threat worldwide, and of course the US wanted to deflect warheads aimed at them. The end result of this wish list? A trilateral statement signed by Yeltsin, Kravchek and Clinton. And who knows why officials are so into holding hands on camera after historical events. Where Clinton dug into his pockets, allocating $800 million to all four countries for nuclear disarmament. Clinton specified that Ukraine would get at least $175 million. Nowadays, Kravchuk claims Ukraine got $950 million. Warheads would be shipped back to Russia, Ukraine would disarm, supporting non-proliferation, and both the US and Russia would guarantee Ukraine's security. Similar vows echoed in the Budapest Memorandum that same year. There, they patted Ukraine on the back for joining the NPT, Influential countries like Great Britain, the USA and the Russian Federation agreed to respect Ukraine's sovereignty and existing borders. These nations pledged not to brandish force against Ukraine's territorial integrity, using weapons only in self-defense or per the UN Charter. The memorandum became effective from the moment of signing. Still, some argue there's a loophole stating that Russia didn't ratify it, hence isn't bound to it. But others could say that the clause on ratifying international agreements would only appear in the Russian federal law a year later. Some took another shot at overturning this document, using the notion of a memorandum, meaning that it's just a declaration of intent, not a real agreement. But you can find this document on the official website of the Russian Foreign Ministry, labelled International Treaty. Either way, at that moment it seemed like all parties got what they wanted. Moscow got the nuclear weapons. Washington let themselves off the hook while reaffirming the status of the global arbitrator. And Kiev got the money and security guarantees. For me, this video feels like the prequel to the Russian-Ukrainian war, unveiling how the Soviet Union's collapse left a massive impact on how today's Russian elites view the world. 
и об этом я уже говорил, что крушение Советского Союза было крупнейшей геополитической катастрофой века. In their worldview, too much federalism is an obstacle in the way of building a strong state. And those countries willing to develop close cooperation with a post-Soviet country are basically an enemy of Russia as the Soviet Union's fall was a colossal catastrophe. And the resulting states are, well, not real. Now, Ukraine's inclination towards Europe didn't start with the Maidan, as often implied by Russian propaganda, suggesting a US-orchestrated coup. Here we find out that the roots of Ukraine's national identity go back to at least 1991. Peter Van Ham explicitly states that since gaining independence, Kiev has aimed westward with the slogan, Our Meta Europe. However, the reality appears to be pulling Ukraine back towards maintaining connections with Russia due to economic and political reasons. Ukraine's security dilemma stems primarily from its precarious geographical position, a peripheral country for both the West and Russia. The current landscape reflects seeds sown in 1991. Understanding the establishment's worldview helps comprehend modern changes and statements. In November 2023, influential Russian politician Pyotr Talstoy suggested barring citizens of countries where Russian isn't the state language from working as drivers, salespeople and couriers. This mostly implies migrant workers from Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan and other post-Soviet states. And the issue is that Russian's one of the state languages only in Belarus. In more human terms, considering the ideological context, it can be translated like this. Let's influence the populations of these countries so that they, in turn, influence their authorities with their discontent. The aim is to make these governments introduce Russian as the state language. Thus, we revive Russian influence in the post-Soviet republics, correcting what's perceived as a historical catastrophe. And now you see the president of Kazakhstan is also crossing the line, speaking at a forum in his native language, thus forcing the Russian officials to reach for their headphones. It happened for the first time in CIS forums, where everyone typically uses the language of the Big Brother. Hence, Russia sends a clear signal to post-Soviet countries. You can proclaim your independence, but you should not forget the Soviet legacy. You know who to send this video to, and a huge thanks to all guys from the Patreon for keeping us afloat. And I'm The Researcher.